this project, as you know, as I've stated, I think to the group in the past, I'm really excited about. I'm really excited about the cooperative because I think, um, and others, and I should tell you that others in the open text, open education field have said the same thing to me, have said, this is something that could really stick and could really change higher education. Uh, there are a number of models of publishing and so on that are that are happening right now, and uh, they're worried about sustainability. They're worried about uh, lots of different things, quality and so on. But they they really see this as, and I do too, uh, as as a pilot of something that has some real potential. Now, something that could trip us up. One thing that could trip us up, I think, is if we came out of this in a couple of years and we had two dozen monographs that were created. The reason for that, uh, you know, is I think once these things are created, they're going to be out there and as we want them to be, that's the whole goal. And um, textbooks are special, they're different. They are not monographs. They, as you know, they are, um, they're more than that. As we've kind of managed the open textbook library, we've had to have just internal discussions about what exactly is a textbook. Because people have sent us things and said, oh, put this in the library, and we've had to make some judgments about, is this even a textbook or not? And it's not an easy thing, right? It's not a black and white thing at all, you know, what's a textbook and what isn't a textbook. But what I want to talk about today is, basically, I want to help you help your authors create something that I think we would all agree is a textbook. Again, I'm not going to define exactly what a textbook is for you, except to say that not only does it cover a body of knowledge, just like a monograph does, but the structure also uses, utilizes some design elements that help the learners learn. Okay, and you can see the, the difference there in the images I posted. You can see lots of structural things in that study of life. That, that's the OpenStax biology book. Um, Everything from font size to call out boxes, a chapter outline is added. There is uh, a, a big picture. There is uh, there are uh, lots of headings and subheadings. There are learning objectives in the box at the bottom. They're all styled in different ways. They're very different than just a monograph, right? So I want to talk about basically go through um, and, and what I'm taking this from. I I think I think this I think this is a module that we're going to and we by we I mean all of us are going to be able to kind of adjust and improve on over time as we go through this. This is based on three different textbooks that I helped some authors create um, and the process that we used and learned and um, improved on I think over time and it's fairly simple and in fact in some ways it's so it's, I, I feel a little bit remiss in uh, including some, uh, there's some things I'd like to add, but at this point, I'm going to keep it very simple and kind of, here's what you do, kind of step-by-step -step, uh, process, okay? So, and by the way, I, I'll, I'll take Jess's approach to this and just say, please interrupt anytime, because I'll get going here, and before we know it, we'll be done. So ask questions, interrupt me, whatever you want to do. Um, so first of all, um, we're going to talk about, uh, you know, so what makes a good textbook, what makes a textbook a good textbook? And, or, and uh, it has really to do most, other than the, uh, the content itself, which we're not going to talk about today, and that's the, that's the author's job. We're going to talk about the structure and the importance of structure in, in a textbook. I want to start out by talking about the tree structure. Um, and by that, I just mean simply one of the very first things you can do with an author is sit down and say, okay, how do you want this thing structured? And this is very simple. This is simply saying, um, how is it, what's the tree structure of the book? What's the over the high level outline that you're going to use? And just name it, whatever it happens to be, whether the book, of course, is the highest level trunk of the tree. And then what? Is it going to be broken into units and then chapter and then sections? Is it going to just be book and then chapter and section, so on? So very simple because that's the most basic structure you're going to be using in this book. And you can see in the chart here that really what that's going to be is this is this really just shows chapter one of this book. If the structure of this one is just book, chapter, section, 
it will eventually help determine, um, again, the, the full tree of the book, okay? When we get actually into the content and breaking it up and asking faculty to actually outline their content, this is what you're going to need. You're gonna to need to know the structure, okay? Any questions about that? That's pretty simple. You would do this for a monograph as well, right? I mean, you would kind of outline kind of what's the structure of what I'm writing. It's just the, the high level uh, overview. I was asked by somebody, by the way, um, what about people who don't write with outlines first? Um, and I don't know how to answer that because I do write with outlines first. This is how I would write any paper. I would write an outline and then I would fill it out. But I know plenty of people who do the exact opposite. They write and then they reorganize the writing into an outline. So like I said, this is something I think, um, <laughs> this I hope is a module that will be able to improve over time. And I don't know the answer to that question. Well, how do you help someone who, who writes in that way? I don't know. But eventually you're gonna to have to end up with this, this outline. All right, so structural elements are the key to the textbook. And this is what you're really missing, at least um, it's not emphasized as much in a monograph. These structural elements are what uh, aid in the learning. So you're taking this information, this knowledge, and you're breaking it up into things, you're calling things out, you're leading the learner in, you're leading the learner out, you're helping them extend, you're helping them reflect, you're helping them bring things together and so on. There's all these different functional things that you can uh, be using and we're, I'm calling them structural elements. Um, so uh, there are different kinds of structural elements. I actually I decided to kind of group them into three different topics. Okay, so in any one of these areas here, a, a book, let's just say a book, a chapter, or a section, you'll, you're going to have different structural elements, okay? And in any of those, like let's just say a chapter, you might have openers, you might have closers, and you might have these, what they're called, what's being called integrated pedagogical devices. And so um, this is what I mean by this. So like, let's look down at this chapter. So let's just say that this box represents a chapter. There's the main content of the chapter, whatever format that happens to be in, whether that's text or whether that's uh, um, um, images or whatever it happens to be. In a textbook, you tend to have bookending those, that main content, openers and closers. I'll talk about the integrated things later. But if we look back up at this book up here, you see, this is, again, this is the OpenStax biology book. This is the beginning of chapter one, the study for life. You see any openers here? Any structural elements that basically lead into the content? Pretty much this whole page is openers, actually, right? There's a big image of, a, of the globe because we're talking about life. You can see the green and the water and everything. You can see the chapter outline. What that does is helps the learner right up front, give them some scaffolding to know like, oh, this is what I'm gonna be learning. And then as they're reading, they'll be able to give it some context. So, okay, this is why this is important because I'm supposed to be learning these things. Here's an introduction, which is probably just kind of a, a lead into it. It might be motivating. Uh, it might be a summary. And then here are the learning objectives, the science of biology 1.1. 1 .1. And, and um, so this is like a section. And this section has a lead, it has an opener that is learning objectives. So pretty much this whole page is full of openers, really. Instead of, they could have just jumped right in and started talking about the study of life, which isn't really even on this page, right? The main content isn't even there, okay? Um, so it could include, and here's some examples, a banner image. So it becomes before the main content, a banner image, learning objectives, an introduction, focus questions, a chapter summary. And um, there's a link there, I created another page, um, and it's from a, a gentleman who, um, who created a list of these, and there's also a list on the bottom of, um, of these structural elements. Closers then, as you can see, closers come at the end of a chapter, and they are oftentimes things like, they help summarize, or they help the student review, there might be some self-assessments, uh, links to help, help extend the content, like here's, a, here's some external resources, right? And so for a chapter, 
you can see this example chapter here. Um, it has these three openers, learning objectives, introduction, focus questions. It has closers, review questions, section summary, solve assessment, and the main content is in the middle. Now, if there are sections within this chapter, that main content is gonna be in the form of a section. And you can see I've blown up the section box because the section also could have openers, closers, and main content, if that makes sense. Again, you can kind of see it in this photo, in this image up here. You can see that this is section 1.1. The main content in chapter one comes within that section, comes within sections like that. The book itself, by the way, I didn't add that on there, the, the, but the book all by itself could have openers and closers as well. Right. Okay, integrated pedagogical devices. And I actually kind of lumped together a whole bunch of things to call them integrated pedagogical devices, but I basically mean structures that in some way could be anywhere, but they're usually in that main content that help structure uh, the content and help focus, help motivate, whatever for the learner. Um, to assist in the learning. So I have some examples here. So, um, so for instance, each chapter could have a biography element that highlights somebody, some famous mathematician, right? And so uh, that becomes a standard element. It helps them understand the context of who created this and why they created it and where it came from, uh, the history behind it. There could be case studies, vocabulary words that are in bold, right? That's a pretty common structural element that you have in textbooks, right? If you, you see a book, we know that we've been trained that, right? We've seen, used so many textbooks. We know if you see a bold word, that's like a vocabulary word, right? So um, these are the kind of elements that are, that can be scattered throughout the main content or the main content is, uses them to structure the content themselves itself. So um, that's what the types of elements are. So openers, closers and integrated pedagogical devices. And does that make sense? Questions about those? I'll give you a second to type if you wanna type or just turn your mic on too. We can also try our uh, immediate feedback system. What's that? That's the, uh, the one for too fast two for just right and three for too slow something like that let me type it in okay <laughs> one is fast two is just right three is too slow so <laughs> aaron's got a two <clears throat> oh great thank you all right Awesome. All right. So um, if there aren't any, did I miss any? I just noticed that my chat wasn't scrolling, so I don't see any questions. Okay. Feel free to type in as we go. So here's the key. And here's what the point I really want to get on. And this is working with the authors then and how to get them uh, to be thinking about these kinds of devices and these, these um, uh, how to make it uh, a, an actual textbook, right? How to use these elements. So this again is based on experience that I had and I was working uh, face to face, like sitting next to the authors. I was actually usually working with groups of authors, but you could, it doesn't matter if it's a group or an individual. What I actually found to, to be really helpful when is to break this up into two different, two different um, processes. Um, and I actually should have added a subheading here to indicate that. Uh, the, first one, the first one is basically the book structure, okay? So, so again, I, I actually found that working with sticky notes was really helpful because it, it, when you're face-to-face, -face, it really, it's, uh, there's nothing like sticky notes to be able to kind of be flexible and move some things around and shift and, you know, be, and so, so basically the very first thing I had them do was define the, diff the, the higher level tree structure of the book. So in this example here, my sticky notes that I've got here, 
the high level is book, chapter, section, subsection. Okay, so that's how the author decided that they wanted to structure the book. The book will have chapters, the chapter will have sections, and the sections will have subsections. Keep in mind that all of this can change. Like, you know, this is just the beginning of the discussion and what you're trying to get them to do is get them to um, structure the book. Um, uh, they could come back later and say, you know what, I realize I really don't need subsections. I really just book chapter section is just fine. I think that's gonna work better for us, that's fine, right? So, so starting at the book level, it's important to start, start there. Um, what we did was actually had sticky notes out that included all these different common elements. We had them just kind of laid out on the table. Okay, so again, there's a link to a separate page here where we have some common elements, openers, closers, and integrated pedagogical devices. So you could basically have sticky notes that um, with each of those or whichever ones you think you, the author might be interested in. And then just simply say, okay, build your book. How do you want this? What kind of elements do you think you need in the book? And so um, you can see in this example, a cover page, a table of context, an index and a glossary. Those are almost, uh, I would say not, I mean, that's just standard books right um there aren't they aren't quite as much a pedagogical instrument as they are just book structure but that's at the book level and then you notice i stuck the chapter in there so the cover page and the table of contents those are your openers the index and the glossary are really your closers right they come after the main content the next step is to then go down to the chapter level and at the chapter level, you say, okay, what elements do you think you're going to need um, in the chapter to make this effective? Now, I'm skipping over, this is where I feel a little remiss in, um, in talking about this, where I'm, I'm sticking really to low level, do this, then this, then this. This should all be based on some learning goals, really, right? I mean, there should be some learning uh, theory mixed in here and how people learn. For now, uh, maybe that's something we can come back to in a future uh, um, talk or future whatever discussion uh, because these things have purpose and they, they are good at different things and they're there for different reasons and it might be worth talking about. Uh, but for now, I'm going to kind of skip over that and just leave it to the author to think what are the parts? How do I envision this chapter looking? And they may say, I want an introduction. I want a chapter outline. I want the learning objectives and the key terms that the students are going to be seeing. I want that right up front. Those are the openers. And then I'll have all the sections of the chapter. And, and then the closers for each chapter are going to be discussion questions and case studies. Now, keep in mind, again, you see how this is kind of cascading down? Each chapter is going to look like this. Each chapter is going to have an intro. Each there's going to be multiple chapters in the book, right? Each chapter is going to have an intro, chapter outline, and objectives, a key term, and so on. And then you're going to do the same thing for sections and subsections, if that's what how they structured the book. So, um, the, the one of the biggest values of doing this is for consistency. We expect that in a textbook. We, students expect that in a textbook. They expect consistency, right? If, if uh, in chapter one, they did an assignment that had to do with the key terms, they know how to find the key terms. Maybe those key terms are in a blue box in the upper right-hand corner of a page. That's just how they're structured in, a, in this textbook. They'll know in chapter two, oh, that's the key terms. And it becomes, it kind of lessens the cognitive load a little bit to be able to kind of instantly see and say, oh, that's a case study. I know I saw in chapter one, they had a case study. This is a case study too, and this is, okay. So you'll do that with each, uh, each level of the tree. You'll write out the kind of the openers, the closers, and then, and, and then the, the, the main content in there, right? How are we doing? Okay, all right, very good. I see a few thumbs up. 
I don't, maybe that's a one. No, all right, I'll assume it's a, okay. Um, I found that this worked really, really well. And even, and with sticky notes, it worked really, really well. Cause, and what you wanna do is you wanna be able to get it in order that they have it, right? I mean, you want it, you want them to actually order it because this will eventually be determining um, the outline of the book, right? There is an order in the book as to which, uh, you know, what comes first. So ask them specifically to order it. Okay, and that's why kind of thinking about as openers and mains content and closers can be helpful as well. Okay. Um, so now when, when this is all done, when these four are all filled out, you now have the book structure. You haven't even talked about content at this point, right? You haven't talked about biology. You haven't talked about ornithology, right? You haven't talked about anything. You've simply just talked about the structure of the book. So now the next step is to talk about that structure and to get them to think about the scope and sequence of the content in the book. Now scope and sequence tends to be kind of a K-12 term that's used more often than it is in higher ed. But I think it's appropriate here to say, um, you want them to think about the breadth and depth of what their content's going to be, and then in what sequence it should be offered. Um, if you have instructors who are experienced and have taught this class before or many times before, they probably have a pretty strong opinion about both of these things. Um, in fact, I noticed, I, 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 I noted in the sequence uh, section there, you know, I, I, someone had, actually it was Nicole Finkbeiner pointed me to, said that the OpenStax chemistry textbook had been revised by some faculty who were adamant atoms first chemistry instructors. They really believe that you should learn about atoms first before everything else. So they actually reordered it and reposted it in connections. I have a link to it there. And, uh, and she was quite happy about that, that they had taken the, the standard chemistry book and reordered it. That's, the, that's a sequence question, right? It's they believe that students learn best when they understand atoms first, okay? Others disagree with that, and they'll stick to the, the, the uh, OpenStax chemistry as it was written. Um, so what you're gonna wanna do here, and this you can, uh, I, we actually did this with sticky notes as well, but it's because we were working with groups are any of you working with groups of in, of authors as is in like a group of authors writing one book or pretty much all individual authors okay yeah right So Kathy, is that book from Yukon? Is that what you're saying? The Adams First? Ah, okay, nice. And uh, yeah, and, and, and Jess making it module, modular, that's right. Thanks for that. Okay, not this round, I have in the past, I have a couple of groups. Okay, so what I found was with working with groups, and you might find there's a digital way of doing this. I would assume with an individual instructor, it might be just as easy to do this on, Google Docs or something to have them create kind of a content outline. Um, we found, um, okay, we found that with groups, um, that it was just nice to have them all in the room and have the discussion right there to say, okay, what are we gonna cover in this book? Because there are going to be differences of opinion and if they're gonna be authoring the book, they're gonna have to work that out eventually, right? So to have them all in the room, have them write down the different levels, the, the, the chapters, the section, whatever it is, the concepts, and then ordering them um, was a nice, it was a nice way to, to, to have a live discussion. Um, how you do, again, but how you, sticky notes are just, they're the best technology, I swear. Um, so let's say then after that process, again, if it's an individual author, I think you could do this any number of ways. Uh, just you know, ask them once they've determined this high level outline. So for instance, in my example here, if the outline is book, whoops, book unit 
chapter section, which is exactly how the OpenStax uh, biology book is, and I've copied this from the OpenStax biology book. A unit contains chapters, and a chapter contains sections. And that's, that's their structure, okay? So once you have this high level book unit chapter thing, you ask them basically to fill that out. And, and um, this is something that's gonna require, um, okay, all right. You've already done this then perhaps. All right, thanks, Karen. Um, and uh, let's see. Okay, awesome. So now, if you've already done this, this is perfect. I, I, I did make a note here, by the way. Um, see this note here about boundless? You should know this. Um, and the authors should know this. Boundless is an open, ed right when I was getting into this work, several 2012 or earlier, uh, Boundless was sued by three different, copy three different publishers. Basically, their business model was that they were going to publish alternatives to, to commercial books using the exact same outline of the book, but all the content would be openly licensed content. So they felt like they could directly compete with these commercial books. Uh, the publisher sued them. It was never, they settled out of court, so it never went to court, which would have been a really interesting case and, and probably would have provided a lot of important uh, uh, case of history there for us to draw on, but uh, it was uh, basically settled. I think Boundless ended up paying each of them $200,000 and promised not to do a bunch of different things. But you get the idea. Um, since you can't copyright facts, the question in the, this is my, some of you are sure are much more knowledgeable about this than I am. Um, the question is, is the, is the structure of facts? Is that a fact unto itself? Is that, you know, is that copyrightable? Is that something they could have rights to? And, and uh, anyway, I, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but I just want you to be aware of that. So, um, uh, that's something that I would guess if I were an author, I'd be tempted to go digging around in my old textbooks that I really liked and start looking at the content and the structure of the content in the book. So anyway, just make sure, making sure that that's something they're aware of. So here's where, here's where the magic happens. All right. So it's taking these two structures and combining them. So you have the book structure and you have the content structure. Okay. And so let's say this is my book structure, this image here. I have a book, chapter, section, um, um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm reading Carla's, uh, may be protectable. Does that mean it is protectable or does that mean it may be protectable or we don't know if that, anyway. Again, I know that's a rabbit hole. So uh, thank you. Um, so if, if book chapter section is the structure, the book structure that they decided on, and then we built out these elements, these are the openers and closers for the book. These are the openers and closers for the chapter. This is, and then the section is really then where the main content is, where the actual content lives, right? A chapter, um, holds sections and that's where the, what we think of as the main content, whatever that content is, that's where kind of those integrated devices live, right? Where there might be call out or there might be highlighted words, there might be um, different structures that help structure the content, might be images, might be anything else. And then, um, and then uh, the review question here is a closer for a section. Let's say then, if that is the book structure, ah, very good, yeah, right, if it's thought of as, uh, if there's some creative original work involved in it, yeah, sure. If every textbook is generally kind of the same structure, or how original is it and how, yeah, anyway, yep. Thank you. So let's say then that this is the content structure that they built, right, of the book. And this is the book structure. We now know if you combine them, we now know exactly what the book outline is going to be, right? The book is gonna have a cover page, a table of contents, an index and a glossary, and there's gonna be chapters in between there, right? So a cover page, table of contents, here are all the chapters, an index and a glossary. We know that each chapter is gonna have 
an intro, objectives, key terms, and a discussion questions after. So here we go, here's chapter 11, meiosis and sexual reproduction. Introduction, objectives, key terms, those are the openers. And then there are two sections in that chapter, and then the discussion questions at the end. And then each section has made the content and the review questions. So you can see these sections, section 11.1, the process of meiosis, has main content review and so on, right? And here's another section that has main content review questions. So what you're basically doing is you're like, the author's work is now really cut out for them, right? Now they know exactly what they need to write. They need to write, um, they don't need to write a cover page or table of contents at this point, but in chapter 11, they need to write an introduction. They need to write objectives, they need to write key terms. They need to write the main, uh, review questions and, and the main content in section um, 1.1, 1 .1, they need to write. So it's, it lays out exactly the boxes that they need to fill in, so to speak. Questions about that, does that make sense? I'll just um, make a note here. <clears throat> yep. uh, this builds nicely on what Tim and Elvis were talking about last week. And it acknowledges that um, you may be doing this in many different orders. There's so many permutations about how these projects are unfolding. Mm -hmm. As many of you have noted in the chat, um, Karen Bjork and um, Amanda it likes this idea of requiring authors to upfront say, you know, here's the outline, here's how I'm thinking about structuring this. Mark mentioned that he already has manuscripts. I know Kathy does too. So these conversations may happen later, like we talked about last week when it, you know, you go back to the author and say, hey, you know, I noticed that you had these elements, but they're not really structured in a particular way. Let's look at sort of standardizing across the chapters. Yeah. So that's something to think about um, as you build your program, what you, you know, how you would like to have this conversation, what you would like this process to be. It may be different um, this first time out than it is, you know, for your second mm -hmm. proposals. Um, but I just wanted to sort of highlight the, the different yep, yep. ways this can all kind of unfold. Right, and this is definitely assuming that you're starting from scratch. Right. right? And, and you like, have them right up front, go ahead. Right, and I'd like to add just a little bit here. Um, it's this idea that we can do this, um, we have the flexibility to work, you know, and add in, like, let's say you don't have introduction for, you know, seven out of your 10 chapters because you're working with a group of authors and, you know, those seven authors didn't put in an introduction for their chapters. You have this flexibility to work on that, like during composition and during editing. Um, but the idea is to get everything sort of solidified before going into InDesign, before going into typesetting. Because before then, you, can, you have all the flexibility in the world to go back and forth and things are so much easier to work in. But once you go into InDesign and things start getting typeset, then that creates uh -huh. you know, separate issues. So this idea of structure is a good conversation, something good to have with your authors, uh, beforehand and and to sort of tie it back to what jess was talking about earlier in the morning it's like you have to have the ideas of accessibility also like sort of in place you know like she said we're not gonna solve everything and we're not gonna be able to you know get everything done where we are gonna fail essentially in certain aspects uh, but we learn from that and we make sure we try to include as much of that um in the beginning like right in this pre-production composition editing phase um and our workflow and everything that we do. And we, of course, we're here to help with this, you know, sort of is set up in that way. And these are some of the elements that we will cover in the OTN publishing cooperative style guide. So we're not going to say like, you have to include, you know, these particular elements, but we will require that you have to include some elements that make it a textbook. So you have the freedom to decide like, you know, this is what works for the this particular author or this particular subject, um, but we will be looking for some, you know, familiar textbook structure in whatever you're publishing in the cooperative. I was just going to add too. one of the things that we have also done is in our author agreement, we require the authors to agree that they will actually create a textbook and we've defined mm -hmm. what that means. So even before the author has fully signed on to the project, the conversation about what a textbook looks like and what they have to create is happening at that time because otherwise we have found that authors will create reader packets or they'll create something that's not quite fully a textbook. So if you have them 
looking at it and thinking about it before they actually even start and agree to take on the money and the grant, right. it's really helped continue the conversation throughout the entire process is to have it right there at front. That's really Super. great. Is that something yeah. you can share with the group, Karen? Like, do you have... Yeah, it's just a Google Doc that I have put together and it's it seriously has like become a living document because each round I've added more things to it and new things to it because I found, oh shoot, we forgot about that or oh, we can't hold authors accountable because of that. So yeah, right. I'd be happy to share. Thank you. Nice. Anything else? Thanks, Karen. So I'm gonna I'm gonna um, back up just a, a second again and and mention one more time that I think eventually it might it just seemed like way too much for today, um, but I think it would be useful at some point to understand what some of these elements are good for, uh, right? I mean, what they actually what value they add? Like, why do you have an introduction to a chapter? What's the point of that? You're, you know, you're already going to say it. Why would you say it again? Um, why do you list the learning objectives? What's the point of that? It's like, what are, so at some point, I think it'd be really useful to kind of dive into that so that, you know, if you start, um, if you understand the author's objectives in a book or in a, in a, in a chapter, you can help perhaps be better armed with tools that can help address those objectives. Like if they really want students to reflect on something, then what are some good tools that are good for reflection? Um, anyway, but for now, I'll just leave it at that. Um, let me think here. Is there anything else I wanted to? Um, so I think um, I, uh, I'm gonna maybe hand it off. I don't know if this is Elvis. You wanna talk about the, the SCML um, piece of this? Yeah. So, uh, so thank you, David. Um, and so I'm not going to talk too much about it. Um, but I do want to mention we put, um, you see that little section in bold there. Um, that is a warning. It's a pretty big warning. Uh, we suggest everybody reads it. Um, when we went ahead and said, okay, these are the elements that are included in a textbook. And later on, there's, um, you know, additional elements. We try to give examples of what um, SML styles you would use. Like, for example, in the cover page, um, there under, you know, in addition, you would see, um, you know, you have BK, BK1, and BKAU, BK for the book title, BK1, for the subtitle and BKAU for the um, for the uh, book author, and we tagged it. Uh, better said, linked it, um, so that way you could easily go to each of those sections in the SCML um, list on our site. Right, so that is there as a tool for you to have an easy reference. Um, now. Uh, what we did is we gave these examples, but this isn't like be all end all. It doesn't mean like, hey, you know, I have body, so I can only use P, PF, PCON, and PSEC, and I can't use anything else. Um, it is not like a hard and fast rule. It's more like guidelines to get you thinking in the way that, um, you know, you should be using those SCML styles. Um, now, as you're looking at your book, as we've discussed in the previous classes, right, we're thinking about this idea of structure and we're thinking about this idea, okay, what is this element? You know, if I have learning objectives, you know, how am I going to compose those? How am I going to treat those? Um, and SCML, and we're not going to delve too much into that because we've sort of covered that um, already. But you will, you'll have the flexibility with SCML to compose things and essentially through that composition, through that application of structure, be able to indicate, hey, this is a learning objective. This needs to be treated in this specific way. Like, let's say, you know, um, to use the example that David brought up, um, you have case studies and case studies are treated like sidebars that are blue. Well, then, you know, your template, your design template will pull from uh, what you've already composed and say, okay, these are sidebars, they're going to be blue. So case studies throughout are going to be consistently in these blue boxes. And that's going to help your, um, your reader sort of always say, hey, that's a case study. If I want to know more about what they're discussing in the rest of this book, I can, you know, and have like some real life practical application, you know, I can look at this blue box for that, right? So when we're looking at 
you know, this idea of structure, we're also thinking, you know, connecting it to what we've learned uh, over the last couple of weeks um, in our classes, which is I'm now applying the structure. So you talk about it, you learn it and you say, okay, I need to have introduction. I need to have summaries. I need to have so-and-so in my textbook. You tell that to the author, the author gives you a manuscript. They might not even, they might just label it and say like, hey, this is the summary, this is the sidebar. And then when you take it and you actually start applying the practical, you start applying you know, your styles as you need to apply them. And you'll see that everything will sort of come together from that point on. So yeah, so that's essentially the sort of like connection that we have to, to SCML. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions. We're not gonna handle composition questions today though. Those we can wait for next, next time. I will mention that um, Elvis was nice enough to put this bottom section down here, the elements in this. I, I think it was Elvis that did that, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I, after that, added this link to this other page where some other common, uh, common elements and so uh, we haven't had exactly the chance to align those or whatever, but that's... But we will. <laughs> but we can, yes, right. Thank you. And so, yeah, so if you look at this, um, you know, this gives you, again, it's a reference, and you'll see that some of them don't have an exact style, like, for example, overview, but what we have is a little note that sort of says, um, you know, this is, could be either treated as part of the body text, or this can be treated um, as, you know, something else, like, you know, a sidebar in itself, or um, a section uh, divided by head, or anything like that. So you have that flexibility uh, available to you, um, to apply the structure that needs to be applied for the textbook. But again, it's think, going back to that idea that we're not producing monographs, which is just, you know, straight text. You know, you're, you're dealing with all of these elements and these things are things that you need to discuss with your authors um, as you're building this. Um, and we are always, you know, more than happy to help. If like, for example, you're talking to an author and you don't know quite how to tell them, hey, you know, you need to have this or this, you know, our the purpose of like having this cooperative and having uh, having us all work together is to be able to, you know, manage situations like that and be able to say, hey, you know, maybe tell your author this and we can give you an example and show them like what we have um, that file that Tim shared a couple of weeks ago where you see like, hey, this is, you know, a P, this is a PF, this is a sidebar and this and we can talk to an author and say, hey, this is why you would do this because it helps the reader learn um, in a, in a better way than what, um, you know, a simple monograph could do. Right. Yeah. Any other questions at all? Because I think um, uh, that's about it for me. And this could be an opportunity too. It seems like some of the questions that were emerging in the chat were about project management, mm -hmm. um, you know, sharing Karen shared her um, author agreement in the chat. Yep. If there are things on your mind about now, how, how do I even kind of manage this process um, retroactively, for lack of a better word, like Mark was saying, you know, oh, well, the manuscripts are already happening. Like, if any of you have concerns about having these conversations later rather than sooner, um, this could be a time to kind of think about that too. And I'll mention that it, 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 you're going to end up having conversations later anyway, even if you do it as cleanly as this. Like, like I was saying, like it, it sounds like a perfect, like, you can do this and this and merge it and you're done. It should be a, an ongoing conversation. It will be an ongoing conversation as they start writing and realize, oh, I don't need this, or, you know, I really could have used this, or, and, the, and, and that's just the way it is. They are interconnected. So doing, you know, this one first, the tree structure first, and then the kind content piece of it next and all that is just artificial in a way that's actually they will write the book eventually that involves both of those structures and so there's you're going to be adjusting whether you start from scratch or not but for sure do publishers actually do some time looking to see Do you mean, uh, do you mean like, would they look at an open uh, textbook and check? Is that what you mean, I mean, Kathy? All right, uh, can you hear yeah. me? Yep. Yeah, um, what I mean is 
one of uh, one of our, um, you know, if a professor has a favorite book that has is not any is no longer offered by the publisher, uh, but the publisher uh, still owns the copyright and it won't do anything, will not share that. Um, should I make sure I look and see, look at that favorite textbook of his to see, I don't want to get sued by Pearson, um, to see if there's that much similarity. I mean, do, how, who, where does the, where, you know, where does the hammer fall? Where's the buck stop? Yeah. yeah. Does anyone know the answer to that? Because I've worried about that myself. If you're having the author basically sign an agreement that says this is an original work, I, right, I think that's in the in the authoring agreement, the template that we have, and Karen, I think yours did as well. Yeah. Glance through it, you know. Yeah. yeah, so we leave it on the author. I've had an author come to me and say, I want to revise a textbook that I created, and I've had to say, you need to talk to the original publisher, and the original publisher said no, and so, you know, we never did the project, right. um, and it's really at the end of the day, you don't, it's really up to the author, but it's also up to you because like for us, Portland State takes on the copyright. So technically Portland uh -huh. State's gonna be held accountable right. and I don't want that risk. So one of the things that I do is it's part of the overall conversation that you continue to have with your authors. And this is not only just about um, sort of does, you know, is it gonna be a publisher? But it's also about making sure that authors haven't, you know, taken on anybody else's copyright. They haven't, you know, put an article that was published by Elsevier into mm -hmm. their book, or mm -hmm. they haven't, you know, used an image that they shouldn't. So a lot of this is really about the overall conversation. And when you do meet with authors, one of the things I require is they show me their manuscripts, where they're at right now. And we have conversations about things that they've been adding or where their original work isn't and are they violating copyright? Because really at the end of the day, you know, if, if your university is taking on the copyright, you know, that you, you take on that little bit of a higher risk. So um, uh, these folks, it, the, these folks won an award from our provost and they didn't get it from me actually, from my, my initiative. And um, this was before we knew anything about anything. Uh, and so there was no, this will be an original book. And, but I suppose I could make another agreement and see if the faculty will sign that. But also I know when we're, we were talking about this in early stages, the, uh, this publishing pilot, I think there was a question as to, we could choose whether the copyright remains with the author or if it is with the institution. And myself, I, we don't have a publishing house here at UConn. We don't have anything. And, and personally, I wanted the, the author to keep the copyright. So if the author keeps the copyright, then they're the ones who will have the problem and not the University of Connecticut. Is that right? Right. Yeah. Right. So the reason why Portland State takes on the copyright is because Portland State pays the authors the money. So we are, so Portland State requires that if we've paid you money, the work for hire, we have your copyright. So we have a textbook that was not done uh, through our program that is published in our repository. And the authors have kept and maintained their copyright because they did it outside of their normal jobs. Um, but yeah, if, if the university is providing any level of funding, you need to talk to the, to your, legal department to see uh -huh. what the university requires because technically my university says it's work for hire. So we've been able to then add the Creative Commons license on top of it. Um, but technically Portland State takes on the copyright. Okay, so then the money did come from the provost office. So there is something tricky about this one. And in the future, when we just give money from our grant, our, our foundation grant, I think we will have more options. Thanks. That's the answer to uh, a question to begin looking into. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? 
So as much as this is a kind of a lockstep process, I just in closing, I'll kind of just back out and just say the main point here is that it, as Karen kind of said, it needs to be a textbook. I mean, it really does for us to be successful and this one needs to come out are things that are useful to students and their learning. And, and I, I think that's what will, um, if that doesn't happen, I don't think this project will be seen as successful. I don't think so. Um, and, and it won't be, uh, they won't be textbooks that people will want to use. And I think that's the goal that we all have. We want something useful to be out there. And, um, and I think that's what the authors want too. So that any kind of help you can give them, whatever the lockstep process is, um, I'm sure it would be appreciated by them. Too. So 